Hey, welcome back. So GPT-4 has been released this week and there's been a huge amount of buzz. So I've been playing with it a little bit and one of the things that I've discovered is GPT-4 can compute. And when I say compute, I mean compute. So before I show you GPT-4 in action, I need to go back to 1967 when a guy called Albert Meyer and Dennis Ritchie. And if you're thinking to yourself, Dennis Ritchie, yep, that Dennis Ritchie, the guy who created the C programming language, created a new programming language called Loop. And Loop was created before C was. Now, if you've never heard of the Loop programming language before, that's okay because almost nobody has heard of the Loop programming language before, but it's actually a super important language. So Dennis Ritchie and Albert Meyer had to solve a problem. They wanted to be able to solve a problem of showing the upper bound of computability in programming languages. So they created a brand new programming language to prove that, and that language was Loop. And you know what, you know, that's what we all do, right? You know, it's like, oh, I can't prove that thing. Let me create a new programming language. Well, that's what they did. And it's a super important programming language and it's super, super simple. And where it actually focuses on is the primitive recursive functions. So I'm not gonna go too much into the detail of what primitive recursive functions are. We're gonna jump straight into the loop programming language, but just so you know, things like factorials, Fibonacci's, addition, exponential, etc., are all stuff that can be solved by primitive recursive functions. There is a set of problems that can't be solved, so it's not a Turing complete language, so you can't do things like the Ackerman function, you know, things like the halting problem can't be solved, but pretty much there's quite a good level of computability that can be performed using primitive recursion. And guess what? The loop programming language is able to perform primitive recursive functions. So if you understand this, you're going to understand a good bit of computer science theory. Bonus! So let's open up the paper just now on the complexity of loop programming languages. Now, it goes into a whole lot of detail. And again, looking back at 1967, the only programming languages that were really around at this point was sort of Fortran, COBOL, ALGOL 60. There was one called MAD as well. And, you know, I think even things like BASIC have only been around for a couple of years at that point. So it's really early in computing science sort of history at this point. So as I said earlier, Albert Meyer and Dennis Ritchie was trying to solve this problem on whether they could look at a program and determine an upper bound on its running time. So they created the loop language. Now in this paper, the loop language is described and I'm gonna show you that really quickly. It's a very, very simple language. And, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna feed these instructions directly into GPT-4 and see if it can learn the loop language. So if you go a little bit further down in the paper, you can kind of see this. A loop program is a finite sequence of instructions for changing non-negative integers stored in registers. There's no limit to the size of an integer, which may be stored in a register, nor any limit to the number of registers. So, you know, pretty, pretty good stuff. It's basically saying you can create as many registers as you like. But here's the interesting part. There is only five types of instructions. So there's assignment, x equals y. There is uh, incrementing, so x equals x plus one. Yeah, you can set x to zero, x equals zero. You can loop, so you can say, go loop me around, uh, you know, basically like a for loop or a while loop or whatever, but it's just loop, it's an unbounded loop, loop x, so i.e. loop number x number of times, and then end. That is literally it. Assignment, incrementing with assignment, setting x to zero, looping and ending. There is nothing else to this language. And it's got a couple of examples there. So you can kind of see there loop x. So go around a couple of times, x equals to x plus one, and then we're done there, right? Now, there's probably some things that you're noticing already in this language. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. There's nothing like subtraction in here. Yeah, and that's okay. There's nothing like multiplication. You're like, and that's okay, because to do multiplication, you're gonna be doing looping. Yeah, loop around multiple times. Even things like factorials or Fibonacci, you can achieve by just looping. So it's a really powerful language and it can do anything that is primitively recursive. So with that in mind, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy all of this text here, which is really the description of how the loop programming language works. And then I'm gonna put that into GPT-4 and we're gonna teach it how to program in the loop programming language. But even more importantly, it's gonna execute it in as well. Okay, the first thing to say is actually ChatGPT knows nothing about the loop programming language. It doesn't know how to code in it already. And even if it did, it would do an absolutely terrible job. So 
I tried to do this video back at Christmas time with GPT 3.5 and it utterly failed. The good news is GPT 4 works. So let, let's switch to GPT-4 here for a second. So you see it's got a cap of 25 messages every three hours, thank you. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy all of this in here, right, which is directly from the paper and I've just formatted it a little bit and I'm gonna paste it uh, into the window. So GPT is gonna analyze that for a second and then it's gonna go, hey, thank you for the introduction to the loop programming language. And then it, it gets, it grasps the concepts really simply, right? I understand it's a simple language, you know, that manipulates non-negative uh, integers. So there's a thing that doesn't support negative numbers. It's a, uh, only supports positive integers. Uh, and it consists of five instruction types. So, you know, X equals Y assignment, you know, it supports incrementing. Yeah, which is great. Setting the integer register X to zero. Uh, it understands the looping for X number of times and it understands and mark the end of the loop. So that is the simplest programming language in the world. So now that it understands that, we can get it to write some simple programs. So if I wanted to do something like squaring a number, it will be able to do that. So write me a program in loop that calculates the square of a number. And as you see, it should be able to get the fact that, you know, it knows everything it needs to square a number. I, you know, if you think about it, it's multiplication. Multiplication is just looping of addition. So let's see how it does. So if we have a look at that for a second, you can kind of see it's going Z equals zero, A equals X, loop X number of times, blah, 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 blah. But it looks okay. But actually what we can do, and this was the point of this discussion, is we can actually get ChatGPT or GPT-4 to be able to do the calculation itself. So watch this. So calculate the square of the number uh, three using loop. So here we go. And this is the cool thing. This is really the difference between GPT-4 and ChatGPT GPT-3.5 Turbo. So if you look here, it's actually working this out step by step. Z equals zero, A equals X, so it's now three. The main loop start, Y is now three. First iteration, Z is one, two, three. Inner loop ends, da da da. So it's literally walking through the steps in the same way as a human being would do, or a computer in that sense, and it's calculating the value. So at this point, you can kind of see at the end of the first iteration, it's got to three. Over here, it's now at six, and then it's doing a kind of third iteration, and then it's gonna come back with the value nine. So there you go. If you think about it, GPT-4 can actually perform calculations because it can now do the logic and now do the working. So if we stop and think about that for a second, not only has it learned a programming language that it's never heard of before, it's actually been able to program in that language and then compute the result. So it was able to compute the result of the square of three by doing the working, working it out. And that's just something GPT-3.5 couldn't do and GPT-4 can't. So now let's get a little bit more complicated. What we're gonna do is actually do the factorial. Again, I said earlier that a primitive recursive function is able to do factorials. So what we're gonna do is get loop to write a program that calculates the factorial of three. And again, once it's done that, we'll see if it can actually calculate the value, compute the value. So as you can see, it's written out the loop program there. So Z equals one, A equals one. It's got a loop there. It's doing some assignment. It's doing Z plus one. It's not breaking any of the rules of loops. So it's really learned the language and uh, it's using the nested loops with, with ends there. So, you know, that looks pretty good. And as we can see here, like it did before, it's actually started working out the, the calculation. So you see it's worked through each loop doing the calculation. So it's doing that compute and working this out until it gets to the end uh, and compare with the, the value, the factorial of three is six. So it's doing an awesome job there, right? It's actually computing. If you think about what a computer is doing there, it's just doing those calculations. This is being a computer.